it's always good to start presentation with a quick survey. Um, so how many of you know something about IBHS? Okay, so we can go fast on the front end. How many of you saw the burns that happened in Orange County in Sacramento last week with the insurance commissioner and with builders? Okay, we've got some work to do. Um, go on IBHS.org or uh, look us up on LinkedIn. You'll see some examples of um, uh, zone zero effectiveness. Uh, we did um, burn with the insurance commissioner, Lara, who uh, was, um, in his words, uh, absolutely compelled by what he saw. Um, when you show, when you give someone a brochure or you talk to them about mitigation, they kind of get it, but it doesn't really get to you in a way that motivates you to really believe it and really want to do something about it. The demonstrations that we did last week did exactly that. The fire chief in Orange County um, came up to us and asked a few questions about the way he's got his patio set up and uh, his words were, I've got work to do when I get home tonight. So if you haven't seen those demonstrations, look them up on LinkedIn, uh, IBHS, you'll find them. Uh, they're videos, they're cool videos, and um, they'll show you. Uh, next year, I will ask you all uh, if you're tired of hearing about Zone Zero, and uh, if you are, then we'll know that we've done our job. Um, so our test facility, um, we like to, um, we do the science, we do meticulous science. It's kind of like watching paint dry on some occasions. Um, we have buildings that we turn at 10 degrees on a turntable, we hit them with wind, we hit them with embers, and we study the effects of it. So some of these research projects will take two, three, four years um, before we get results. But at the end, we get cool videos, which I was going to show you, <laughs> that highlight what the research actually shows. And then we go out in the field. And we see if the things that we're seeing happening in the lab actually do happen in fires. Right? So it's proof testing the science. What you see here is that um, the height of the deck really does matter. So if you've got a deck, clearing the vegetation underneath it is critical if your deck is three, four feet off the ground, which many of them are. So the vegetation underneath the deck on the right caught fire. It then got up and into the joist and whipped its way towards the house. It would eventually ignite the siding and go up the siding into the eaves, and then you've got a disaster. On the left-hand side, you can see, if you look carefully, you can see the scar marks on the, uh, on the pole. And so the pole took some heat, but it, the flames never got up into the deck itself, which didn't provide. So that stopped a pathway toward the house. Um, so, so we know something about decks. If, if we've got a deck that's four feet or less in height, then you need to screen underneath it to stop any embers getting in and you need to maintain the vegetation that would be there. Similarly, we see with windows, uh, when you get radiant heat that um, attacks a window, you'll find two things will happen. Number one, if it's a vinyl window, it, it doesn't take that much heat for the vinyl to melt. And then the, the window and the, the pane on the outside will just drop to the ground. So you need to have another pane behind it, which is tempered, which can take the heat and will provide that barrier for embers getting into the house. Um, you'll also see that the, the progression of fire so this is from the campfire. Uh, the image on the left is at time zero, and the image on the right is two minutes later. And what you see is a pathway for fire to get from ground, vegetation here on the left, goes up towards the fence, catches the fence. The fence, the fire progresses towards the tree. It ignites the tree. The tree is overhanging the house and it ignites the eaves of the house, and then you've got a total loss. And that progression happened within two minutes. And that's similar to what we see in our lab when we, when, once a house catches fire from embers, you could see the flames going up within a minute, minute and a half. It's over very quickly. Embers are really important. Again, zone zero. If you look carefully at this picture, you'll see that that kind of semicircle of embers so these embers are hitting the house at around about 20 miles an hour. So the fans are on, this is our test facility. Um, and what happens is the embers will hit the house and many of them will just fall down 
the side of the house, and so they'll start to accumulate at the bottom. And some of them will bounce off the house and form this kind of semicircle. Well, that's five feet. That semicircle, the arc there is five feet, and that's why we say five feet is so critical, because this happens over and over again. We like to demonstrate uh, what happens when a house catches with embers. Um, it is the leading source of ignition. And this is, uh, we call this the she shed. We burned it three times in 2019. Uh, we rebuilt it and then well, we didn't, it wasn't a total burn. We, we uh, put it out before it was a loss. But you can see an unmitigated side here, which is fairly typical, and then a mitigated side on the right. And that's what the demonstrations from this weekend, last weekend, uh, showed too last week, rather. And if the video had played, you would have seen what happened uh, as, the, as the flames progressed. On top of this, this again is, is the campfire. Uh, kudos to the fire services for defending the houses at the top left there. Um, everything else was, was a complete loss. If the stat is, if a house is ignited, you've got about 90% probability it's going to be a complete loss. That's something that we've seen, and you see it in the CAL FIRE data. This is the DINS data from CAL FIRE, which shows on the left there that across building type, single family, multifamily, and commercial, um, you've got at least an 80 to 90, in some cases over 90% chance of a complete loss. On top of that, again, zone zero. Um, this is a study that was done with Zesty. Um, it's an AI study with their database of, of post-fire and pre-fire analysis and shows that um, if you reduce the vegetation in the zero to five, you're doubling the probability of surviving the fire. So again, the criticality of a non-combustible zone five, zone zero. So that's the, that's kind of some of the signs. So what do we do about it in order to mitigate these problems? Well, zone zero, again, uh, Nothing combustible in zone zero. When we say nothing, we mean nothing. Um, embers will find the weak link, and the weak link is what you leave in zone zero that's right next to the house that can be set on fire. It sounds really tough, it is tough, and it is the biggest barrier to adoption. But it is also the most critical part of the, uh, the mitigation that uh, that occur. There's a little bit of a failure of imagination and a little bit of uh, dis disbelief in this, and that's why we're doing these demonstrations across the, uh, across the West Coast to actually prove that Zone Zero is so important. Six inches of vertical clearance. You saw when the embers hit the side of the house and they start to gather along the the bottom edge. If that bottom edge is combustible, then critical mass of embers will ignite it. So um, in California, most modern houses have this six inches and they have it for termite control. Um, older houses uh, may need to be mitigated um, in order to provide that, uh, that safety level. Um, this is one of my favorite videos. Imagine there are embers coming through that towards you. Um, this is what happens um, when you don't have a properly mitigated vent, those embers will just come in through the vents um, and they will find whatever you've left in your attic. They'll find Christmas paper, they'll find old books, they'll find things that are highly combustible. Um, and there's enough energy in those to actually start a fire. If, if the video had been working, you would have seen what happens when you mitigate it, uh, which is you get some really fine particles coming through but there's not enough energy in them to actually uh, ignite anything. Roofs and gutters. This is where the good news is. The roof is one of the most expensive things to replace, but most people in California, absent those that have wood-shaped roofs, have a Class A rated roof. It's a fire-rated roof. Um, that test came in, I think it was in the 80s, um, and now you can't find any shingles or any roofing product in California that's not Class A rated. Um, other states are not quite there yet, um, but I think the trend is towards generally towards Class A across the uh, across the industry. 
non-combustible gutters and downspouts, <laughs> vinyl melts. Um, if it's combustible and you've got fuel in there, what will happen is it will ignite and then the flames will get into your attic. And once they get in your attic, the game's over. Um, it's, it, anyone that's in firefighting will tell you once the flames get in the attic, you're, you're done. And then the roof gutter downspouts, all of that again is, are, are places for fuel to, to gather for vegetation and embers getting out of that. So we put all of that together into wildfire prepared home. Um, some of you may have seen the slide before. Some of you may recognize the house from Paradise. This was the, this is the first house that was designated wildfire prepared home base. Uh, all the things that I've just talked about are there in brown. So that's the base level, which is geared towards a retrofit. So it's really hard to replace windows. It's really hard to replace siding. It's really expensive to do that. So we geared the, uh, the base program, which protects against embers um, for these items. And from a new build perspective, or if you're particularly well-funded and you want to retrofit uh, to the plus level, then the blue items over in, in blue covering gutters, moving out buildings at least 30 feet away, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are all, um, those are available too. The point behind this list is, is that, as I said, you know, you, you don't want to leave any weak link. You have to do all of these things in order to qualify for a designation. So it sounds really hard, it is hard, and it needs to be done for the reasons we've talked about. But all of these brand things are done. People have managed to do it. Um, I'll tell you that people apply for designation. Zero people so far have gotten the designation first time. So they'll get an inspection and there'll be one or two or three things that they need to do. Usually it's one shrub that they particularly like but they don't want to move out of the zero to five. Um, but these, these things are achievable, you just got to want to do them. So that's the Wildfire Prepared Home Program. That's at the parcel level, and we're going to talk a little bit about the community level too. Um, the designation process is, is very similar to the fortified process, in that you would take in a, you would apply, you get an inspection. We, uh, we have a network of inspectors that we're growing. Um, and ultimately, IBHS does the quality assurance to make sure to give the confidence to our member companies that the inspection was done thoroughly and that the, the house is mitigated to the expected level. And then they get a certificate uh, to state that. The designation is good for three years. And every year, um, starting off at this point in the program anyway, every year there will be an, a landscape review vegetation grows, you've got to maintain it. Um, people have buy things like trampolines and sheds and put them really close to their house. Uh, so we need to be able to detect those things and, and keep the same level of mitigation on an ongoing basis. After three years, there's a redesignation which basically starts the process over again. Uh, this is a comparison between Commissioner Lara's uh, program for Safer from Wildfire and wildfire prepared, it, the items in white are where there's a match, and the items in brown are where there's additional requirements. So you can see on the left there that wildfire prepared provides all of the things that the commissioner is looking for, uh, and then Dan goes further too. All of this information from inspections is available to IBHS members. Um, so even if somebody does not achieve a designation, and you're required by the regulation to give partial credit for uh, individual mitigation actions, our members will be able to access that information if there's been an inspection. Community level. Uh, this is the bit that we're working on now. This is really tough. Um, we're trying to get an open source approach to community mitigation data so that you'll be able to look at any community <coughs> in the West, ultimately, and, and see its vulnerability um, across a number of these data dimensions that I'll highlight. And the most obvious thing is true, most communities are already built. So you look, there are certain things you can retrofit, and there's a lot of things you can't. So that's, that's just a feature of the community. 
So we have to look at the things that we can control and the things that we can't control. Um, skip along here. So existing factors, did you build four feet, four uh, miles into the forest, right? You can't change that. Um, and so there are built, uh, built environment conditions, surrounding vegetation, pretty obvious, structural characteristics of how the roads are set up, um, supporting infrastructure in terms of water, in terms of electricity that would be available for firefighting, that kind of thing. Those are pretty much existing factors. And then there are things that you can control. So how many of the houses have a designation for wildfire perpetual? Um, what are the fuels that are within the community and how are those broken up to prevent spread from one, uh, from a spot fire to a house? And then what regulations are in place to enforce any mitigation and ongoing inspection requirement? And ultimately, this is what you're trying to prevent. This is the, uh, the start all the way through to uh, conflagration where you see there in the middle, uh, fire service is totally overwhelmed um, and their focus is on life safety, is not on your structure. And if we do it right, then we'll avoid this. Uh, some other insights for you. Uh, if you go on IBHS.org, you can find this, this report. This is uh, um, based on our insights from La Hina Fire. Um, which basically says that the houses that, that were partially or fully mitigated did really well. Um, I think you're all familiar probably with the Red Roof House, which um, was a, created a non-combustible zero to five feet zone, but they didn't do it for fire. They did it for uh, water management off the roof, but it did work. And there are other insights in that, in that report that you can get. The other one is, uh, we've just published this one, again, on IBHS.org, the return of configuration. We thought we'd solved this problem 20 years ago. We didn't. And I'm out of time.